Hey guys, thanks for having me. This is Andre from One Minute Economics. I'm an economist who also runs businesses occasionally, who also invests in exotic assets like cryptocurrencies. Some of you might know me from my One Minute Economics channel, which is getting a decent amount of exposure lately. And I am here bugging you today to talk about something that's uh, that's been making me uneasy for an extended period of time. I mean, on my channel, I've kind of made a name for myself as a balanced economist. I'm not exactly the doom and gloomer type who says that, you know, the world's going to end any minute now. It's not, it, it's not the thing. It's not, you know, how I'm branding myself. And this is, this is kind of what I'm trying to tell people that sure, when a doom and gloomer panics, no problem. They always panic. But when someone like myself is starting to be terrified about this or that, economically speaking, I assert that it at least makes sense to listen to what I have to say. And I'm concerned about the things I'm covering in my book. Let me just grab it real quick and show it. It's called The Age of Anomaly. The full title is Spotting Financial Storms in a Sea of Uncertainty. And I didn't write this book to warn people that, oh my God, we're going to have a financial crash. The sky is falling. The sky yeah. is falling. Yeah, I, mean, I, can of fix, I can fix that, by the way. <clears throat> I know, guy. I can fix all your anxiety, by the way. Yeah. I can so, cure you. Are you going to be on my psychiatrist couch, uh, couch today? Couch today, Andre. That would that would not hurt one. When I when I'm done with you in this interview, you're going to feel wonderful. You're going to, you can't care if the stock market goes up or down, whether Trump makes love to Putin. You don't care. Everything is going to be groovy when I'm done with oh, you. Oh, yeah. Now, by the way, I am Claude Diamond in the United States of America. <laughs> Glad to be here, Claude. And uh, I mean, look, as someone who even trades cryptocurrency, I'm not the type of person who is easily spooked. Like cryptocurrencies can be down thousands of dollars in a day, they can go up just like that. So ex I'm exactly the opposite of the type of person who's easily spooked by a market. Crash. I don't like cryptocurrency. Well, that's perfect. It means there's more for me. <laughs> I, have a bridge, I have a bridge in Brooklyn, New York, and there's no toll booth on it. I could sell it to you for a very good price. You put a toll booth. See, to me, cryptocurrency is sucker. It, it's, you have no control. How, I hate things where I can't control them. Yeah, I mean, I tell people I'm not exactly you know, the type of person who becomes a fanboy of something. But as someone who lives in Romania, more so, I'd say, than people from the United States, and especially as someone who tried to do business in Romania, there was just one problem, let's say 10 years ago when I started having, being involved in more serious pro, uh, projects, which is the fact that nobody wanted to have anything to do with me. Like at that point, PayPal did not accept Romania, for example. Why? And you know, I had, they were like, yeah, of course, they're gonna give you a textbook response, like for your, for your protection, we are unable to approve your account right now, or just you know, some template issue. Does Romania have a bad, inter uh, is in Romania, uh, and don't, please, I'm not trying to be offensive here. Is Romania kind of like uh, Nigeria, where we get these emails that I just found out I'm the crown prince of, uh, of South Africa or something like that? No, um, no, I mean, we're not the people who tell you you're now the Sultan of Brunei, no. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, nowadays Romania is a member of the European Union, nowadays PayPal accepts us and it's all good. But like 10 years ago, 15 years ago, it was a huge problem because we were not in the EU back then. So nobody took us, nobody took us seriously. And then you did have this problem, right? Like you had this ability to do something, whatever it is, like design websites or whatever it is you're good at, but you had trouble getting paid for your work essentially. And really? of course, so, oh yeah, oh, oh yeah. Oh, I'm, I'm surprised because the one thing about entrepreneurism is we don't care who you are, where you're from, what you look like. Can you make me money? Can you solve my problem? I don't care where you live or what you do or what you look like. That's why I love capitalism. Do people in Romania, do people in Romania love capitalism? I have to say that, that, that among people in Romania, I'm, I'm a rarity. So percentage wise, People in Romania aren't hooked on entrepreneurial stuff. And in, in a way, not? if you think... Why not? Capital, socialism, communism, it sucks. It, there's no country in the world that has the lifestyle of modern capitalist countries. Why isn't everybody doing that? I agree with you 100%. But yeah, when you had like, uh, Romania was under a communist regime for 50 years. I was born in the year of the Romanian revolution. And okay. nowadays, of course, more and more young people are starting to get that, you know, Capitalism is the way to go. I wouldn't be here without capitalism. Yeah. But 
Yeah, but uh, it's a generational thing. And our poor, in, our poor people in this country, the United States and Canada and most modern Western countries, our poor people are, are rich compared to some third world countries. They have cars, houses and things, and they still think they're poor. Isn't that amazing? Of course. I mean, we have numbers about the GDP growth of various com countries that were under communism, and you have the GDP growth numbers of everyone else, and everyone else had a four times greater growth rate. So yeah, the numbers make sense. But why still, do you think Donald Trump acts the way he does? I'm not going to get political here. But why do you think he's so loud and like me? And so um, he's always right. And why do you think he has that personality like that? Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, he's a sales guy. He's a sales guy. Everything yes. about him is all about sales. And this is what he tries to do. This, uh, he is good. He's good at pitching stuff. That's his thing. You know, he's for some people. He's a salesman, all quintessential salesman. He'll say one thing and then he'll apologize the next day. Like he's always doing. He's always selling. He's always adapting. He, you know, and he has this, he has this uh, personality where he just wants to get stuff done all the time. And he's, you know, he, he's really built a, he's a very successful businessman, regardless yeah. of how you feel about him politically. Yeah, I mean, in some cases, like you said, regardless of what you think, facts are facts. And yeah, to a lot of people, to a lot of people, especially, uh, you know, over here in Europe, where we're not exactly sales oriented, not sure how many people from Europe, Europe you've done business with, but. Well, I have a lot of, cl I have clients in 18 countries, a lot of Europeans, uh, Afri African, uh, Asian clients. Uh, I work with people all over the world. And the one thing is sales is the million dollar skill, communicating your products and services to people, persuading them, influencing them, that their lives can be better with what I sell, what I do. I have a question for you though. Sure. What, what your book, okay, tell them the title again. The Age of Anomaly, Spotting Financial Storms in a Sea of Uncertainty. Is the you wrote book. about all the depressions, the tulip wars, all the, all the rip-off screams, all the stock market crashes. What made you write a book about all this depressing stuff where people have gone broke overnight? Yeah, I mean, like, like I tell people, there, there's really no need, one, to be depressed. And two, even if you get depressed, it's not going to do you any good. However, what is going to do any, uh, you a lot of good, tremendous good, I'd say, is studying history not because i have this magic formula to teach you how by studying history you will know exactly when and how the next financial crisis will hit because i don't nobody knows for sure but you study history because it gives you a glimpse into human nature you're in sales we're all about human nature history teaches us who we are and by knowing what makes us stick you're going to be able to position yourself better. And that's what I'm telling people with my book. That's my, that's what I do on my channel on one minute economics. I'm like, look, you cannot escape economic decisions. You make them each and every day. So I know you have lives. I know you have families, but give me a minute of your time. And I'm going to give you the best bang for your time, not your buck that I possibly can. And the same principle is valid with my book. Exactly. This, this stuff should not take over your life. You shouldn't, you know, as of this point, you shouldn't be obsessed with these things at the same time. However, there is no escaping the fact that crashes are cyclical. These things just happen. And if you're armed with knowledge and if you have a simple coherent strategy that you can easily implement, because that's what I'm all about. I know it's not my intention through the, through the age of anomaly to make everyone an economist. Well, they, 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 there's an expression. Those who don't serve to study and revere history will repeat it. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And to me, I, th I, I couldn't care less if the stock market crashed or anything else. Same I'm a glass is half full. Warren Buffett, the, the billionaire, one of the richest men, if not the richest man in the world, he makes more money when there's a cataclysmic downturn in the stock market. The same Warren Buffett, you know, he always says, be fearful when everyone else is greedy and greedy when everyone else is fearful. And that's precisely what I teach people in my book. I'm like, look, these things aren't rocket science. I'm going to teach you how to put together a list of assets you consider desirable. I go through each of them one at a time, traditional ones, exotic ones as well. And I'm look, I, I tell them that by reading my book, you're going to know exactly for your specific situation that I want to invest in this asset for that reason. I want to invest in the other asset for another reason. And these things are going to be firmly entrenched in your subconscious. And then by having a firm grasp of what do you want to do and how you want to do it, we're going to get right back to Warren Buffett. When everyone else is going to panic that the stock market is crashing by 60% or whatever, you're going to say, wait a second, 
I know that I want exposure to this stock. I want exposure to this company. I want it. They're good companies. I want a piece of them. And hey, if everyone else is panicking, that's perfect. I can get them at a cheaper price. And the same principle is going to be applied when it comes to each and every asset. And that's the key. Knowledge. Like people are running around when there's a panic like headless chicken because they don't have a firm grasp of how these things work. But once they do, they're going to realize it's, you don't have to be a genius to pull it off. You just have to do a few simple things like I outlined in my book. And of course, the sooner you do it already, like I, the better. Like I always tell people, I'd much rather start preparing a year too soon than a week too late. But this preparing a year too soon doesn't mean you have to spend all your time doing it. Yeah, it's, I, I, uh, believe in, yeah. I, I believe in preparation. We, you remember this, the crash, the banking crisis in 2007. Obama yep. was not president yet. Bush was still president. Uh, it was almost 2008. And we had a tremendous crash in this country in terms of real estate. It was overpriced. It was overfinanced and everything like that. I saw that coming about a year to or about a year earlier. I saw it was too good to be. When my, my feeling is when things are too good to be true in the economy, that's the time to start being cautious, conservative, maybe even get out. I was in real estate. I sold a lot. I saw it coming. And your book is about preventive medicine, basically. Exactly. The way I see it. It's about, so I saw it coming because I read a lot. I watch the tea leaves. I try to use a lot of common sense. I sold a great deal of real estate before the crash. I still saw, I, and I regretted some of it because some of it kept going up in value. I live in California where real estate mm. is extremely expensive. And the real estate, start, and the real estate uh, started to go down and I got out early. And I was able to protect my capital. So what you're saying is, is, to, is to adjust and prepare yourself, basically, for whatever is going to become. I know one thing about business, it, about real estate or the stock market goes up and it goes down and nobody knows exactly when. Would you say that's basically what you're trying to tell people is prepare for the ups and downs of, of finance and capitalism? Exactly. Exactly. There's nothing. It's just a business cycle. Unlike many of my peers and like many of the other economists, I don't, I, I, I don't really try to work on my crystal ball. I don't brand myself as the guy who can predict the future. I don't. And actually in my book, one, of course, I teach people how to position themselves properly to understand what makes humans tick. Of course, that's one dimension of my book. But two, just as important, I tell them, look, I think about these things a lot due to the nature of my occupation. It's what I do. But even someone like myself might be caught by surprise, like by a black swan event or something of that nature. And therefore, I dedicate in my book just as much energy to becoming more financially resilient in general. And by, by kind of tapping into these two dimensions, you don't, you don't really need to do much more from a financial perspective, which is what I specialize in. Excellent. Excellent. How important do you think it is for someone to be a good communicator, a good salesman? I'm a sales trainer. I'm the author of the Gut Sales book. Okay. I teach people. I think it's the million dollar skill. No matter what business you're in, it is. good times or bad. I think, I don't even care. You know what my definition of success is, Andre? Have you ever read any of my, I have one definition of success. Take everything away from me. Houses, cars, clothing. Yeah, same. Strip me naked. And, and you get me to a telephone and in 30 days or less, I am so confident. I feel so good about myself. I've worked on my communication skills so well that in 30 days or less, I will be a one percenter again. As an economist, do you know what we mean in America by a one percenter? Oh, yeah. And, and also as an entrepreneur, I've been there. Like I, I started making money back in high school, which in Romania was a huge deal. And I made, made a lot of money. How did you make money in high school? Uh, yeah, well, I, uh, I started out just by freelancing, by selling my time, then I moved on to hiring other people, and I, I initially wrote, believe it or not, articles in English, and that's how I got money. Then I hired a bunch of people from the U.S., like work-at-home moms and students and so on, and they worked for me. Then I moved on to other services. I then uh, ended up owning three hosting businesses, an auction platform, a wow. small escrow site that, you know escrow.com, a small escrow site that was indirectly sold to escrow.com, and they were sold themselves as well. So I, I did very well. Like I, I made a bunch of money for someone my age, but then, you know, sh stuff happens. My mom got sick living in Romania. We don't exactly have the best medical system in the world. I took her to Vienna, to Austria to get some really good treatment, basically the best money can buy, but I was wiped out. You know, I, I wasn't the type of person who spends lavishly or whatever, but still this one event took its toll on me. I started, I, I, I had to start from scratch, but it's all here. It's all here. And again, here, here. I've been involved in, here. I'm an economist who, yeah, I'm a hands-on guy. 
I, I like I'm an economist who puts like a pretty decent, I feel, balance between book smarts and street smarts on the table. And yes, it's all about the sale. It's always about the sale. Like, how am I trying now to, to tap into people's mind? Like, my right now, right now, my number one goal is getting my message to as many people as possible. To do that, guess what? They have to find out that my book exists. So it's all it's always about the sale whether you're an economist selling books whether you're selling yourself when looking for a job or whether you're an entrepreneur it's always about the sale tell us about entrepreneurism in Ro romania i think a lot of people who know me or watching this don't know much about romania wait is, is there a is there a burgeoning entrepreneur mentality in romania right now are we seeing something are are people wanting to start their own businesses and things like that there can would love I, I would love to say yes. I would love to say yes because that I'm all about business. Is it? Is there enough freedom so anybody can go out and sell? Oh something? yeah, there's 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 complete freedom here. You I can do that. whatever. You can do whatever you want. But and this is the fight we're having here in Romania. After 50 years of communism, everyone wants the government to take care of them. Everyone wants a cozy government. You know the American dream doing something with your life, making something happen, you know, like what we're doing right now. The Romanian dream, getting a comfortable job working for the government. So, wow, yeah. so boring. But a few people like you, there's a lot of young people like you say, hey, oh, yeah. I want more. I want a lifestyle. I don't want a, I don't want a pension from the government. <laughs> I've got to be poor the rest of my life. And, and you know what the ridiculous thing is? That, that, hey, okay, for someone from the U.S. or Germany or whatever, yeah, but from someone like, a, like I am from Romania, where it's not like the quote unquote system gives you all that many amazing career options. So for someone like myself and Romania, people ask me, Oh, why did you risk so much to do your own stuff? And I'm like, it would have been risky not to do my own stuff and rely on freaking Romania for my living. You know, that's, that's, that's what frustrates me personally. And that's why I'm trying to get more people to hop on this train to do their own thing. It's a power of example thing as well that I, you know, I, I try to reach people with in Romania. But it's an uphill battle because the mentality over here of relying on the government, on um, wanting to work for the government and everything like that, it, it, it's so darn widespread that it, it's going to take a good generation or two be, before the percentage of people like myself increases a lot. So when other people see that you're entrepreneurial, you, you own your own car, you own your own house, you have freedom, you can do what you want when you want, you want to take a vacation, you have enough money to take care of your parents. You're a good son, by the way. Mm -hmm. I, I love my freedom and entrepreneurism, my business, because it allowed me to take care of my parents too, who are both ill. So we have that in common. I, the freedom, though, I, it's amazing to me. I, I, did you, did, are you familiar with Ayn Rand? Oh yeah, I've read. Uh, I've Atlas read the Fountainhead. I, I, I've read Atlas Shrugged as well. Should everybody? Should every? Do people in Romania um, study free enterprise? Uh, watch free enterprise movies and speakers and read books like uh, uh, like that? Do they? What do they think when they see people who who just live a wonderful lifestyles? What is, what's going through their mind? Don't they want that? Do they watch them? Yes. Do they internalize the stuff that's being done there? Absolutely not. And that's, that's the main problem, you know. And the attitude they have towards a lot of people who are successful, once again, something I mean, they were like, yeah, 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 he was successful, but he got lucky. So yeah, it's so risky to do your own thing. He, he, of course he did well, but he got lucky. Or of course you're doing your own thing. But, and many Romanians, I've realized freedom is a dangerous thing. Freedom yeah. is a dangerous thing. Like, you know, those who are willing to sacrifice essential liberties for, in exchange for freedom deserve neither is, is a saying that's popular in America. And it applies over here as well. People are terrified, are terrified of taking chances. People are, and they're willing to rationalize absolutely anything the way. You can show them case studies in the United States. You can show them, I don't know, the guy who coded who programmed WhatsApp, the popular app, who went from being on food stamps to being a billionaire. Yeah. But they, 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 still, they still think it's a scam somewhere in between. They're still like, yeah, 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 sure. I understand what you're saying if, if you have conversations with them. And I, most of them, maybe one out of them is going to be, okay, yeah, I like what you're doing. I want to do what you're doing and I'm going to do what you're doing. But nine out of 10, they're going to be like, yeah, you're right. You're correct. Everything you're saying is true, but it's kind of, it goes over their head. It, it, they're listening, but they're not actually internalizing this stuff. They're not so actually. Like how, this is a cultural change that is event that's slowly happening over there. Do you get speakers? Do they listen to Anthony Robbins, Brian Tracy? Yeah, they do. They do. They do. But, but, but there's a difference between, between, 
genuinely having this desire to be engaged and to put the stuff you learn to good use and just listening as if you're watching a movie. And that's, that's kind of the distinction I want. Way too many people, yeah, they listen, they watch Tony Robbins on YouTube or they watch one of the other, you know, another good speaker and maybe they get pumped for like a few minutes, but they have no intention, genuinely speaking, of internalizing those things, you know? Interesting. As far, yeah, as far as most people are concerned, again, not all. And once again, I do, I do want to say it's not all gloomy. Like we do have younger generations that are more and more looking into this stuff. But uh, I've learned that in certain situations, it just takes time. So it's, it's a generational shift kind of thing. So it's, it's that poison, down to be- that communism, that dictatorship, those totalitarian governments, yeah. they just poison generations of people, don't they? <laughs> They poison generations of people and those generations of people, we call them mom, dad, you know, those generations of people then educated the newer generations. And yes, some, some people are realizing, wait a second, some of these values that we've been taught in communism, they're awful and, and we have to move away from them. But, but it's just ultimately, ultimately, I, I've kind of learned to accept the fact that things are going in the right direction, I feel, but it's going to take time. What did the Ceausescu uh, government? Yeah, Ceausescu. Ceausescu, thank you. And uh, I know enough to be dangerous here. Uh, when, did, when did that government fall? Yeah, well, first of all, you know, there was this uh, context. As you know, in 1991, the USSR fell. And even so, like the USSR went from 14.31% uh, as a share of the world's economy in 1969, which was their peak to just uh, 3.58% in 1991, which was the year of, of their dissolution. And that was kind of a contextual thing with the Iron Curtain and then a bunch of countries that were under their sphere of influence, of influence in one way or another, then communism fell over there as well. And initially in Romania, I, I'm pretty sure that the goal of people was to implement a type of perestroika here, something like Gorbachev tried to implement uh, over there as well but eventually no we did try we we did eventually move to a system for better or worse uh based around free markets but but again at at the beginning of 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 what we went through in romania after the revolution think of it as something similar to what's going on in russia you know like a bunch of people a few people who have government connections getting filthy rich and but but overall the economy not doing much and now as members of the european union as you know earlier on as NATO members as well, we started being taken seriously internationally as well. So things are on the right track. The words cannot begin to describe how much easier it is to do business in Romania now than it was 10 years ago. So if I was in Romania and I wanted to start, um, I like beer. I've never had a Romanian beer. I bet it's good. I bet you have great beer there. If I want to start a beer company in Romania and I made a great beer in my home and I bottled it and it was at a beautiful label design, could I go out and just sell it on the streets or to restaurants and bars and hotels? Could I just go and do that, right? Just go out and start a business with my great Claude's Romanian beer. Well, the process of starting a business is not that difficult. It's not that difficult. But still, yeah. still, there's, a, there's way too much red tape involved for my Okay, for now, my right, taste. that's the part that bothers me. And I hear that from people in other countries all the time. The red tape. Where is this? Why, I can't just go out and knock on doors and sell I stuff. know. I know it, 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 it's it, it's frustrating, and okay, as someone who as someone who runs an online pro- based business, it's not that big of a deal. It's, it's perfectly fine. But oh. if you want to actually have an offline presence, if you want to sell that beer to someone, if you want, then good luck. Good luck. You're gonna get contr- you're gonna get audited by you know the food safety department that we have over here. You're gonna get audited by the ITME. Uh, you know to see how you're uh, handling your workforce and. In, in the earlier history of Romania, being quote unquote audited meant that a bunch of people are coming to you with the intention of receiving a bribe from you. Yeah, but nowadays, yeah. <laughs> but, but nowadays, yeah. now, and nowadays it's, uh, things have evolved. I have, friends, I have friends even in, in, in modern country, in, um, uh, from the UK, for instance, and they say there's way too many regulations over there. And they actually came here. Uh, because they, they, they felt it was much more open. I truly believe in, in capitalism is the, is the greatest democratic principle. You can fi- if you fail or succeed, it's up to you uh, exactly. whether you want to do it. And I, and I love it. And I think, and I don't want to sound like I'm an American propagandist, but I do believe that capitalism um, allows people to live a great lifestyle and to do what they want or to fail on their own 
if they fail, it's their fault. If they succeed, it's their fault. Or they can play it safe like in other countries and get a job with a regular company or go on a social program and be poor the rest of their life. But at least here, you have the opportunity to start it's on you. Yeah. And knock on doors. And, I, and that to me is what makes a look at the lifestyle in countries that embrace capitalism is so much, is so much higher than in other places that start to institute socialism and, and worse. Yeah, like uh, by living in it, as someone who lives in a country where entrepreneurism isn't as widely spread in the, in, in the U.S., I am frequently a U.S. Propag propaganda guy because I, lo I love the United States. Without the United States, there wouldn't be this Internet thing, it's most likely not in this form. Like without the United States, some random dude from Eastern Europe wouldn't have made a name for himself making videos in English and writing books in English that people buy and people then recommend to others. And I wouldn't have been able to like, you know, launch all of these businesses and do so successfully. And that's what I was going to ask you. How has the internet changed Romania, changed Europe, changed things? How, it, does that, how has that changed? It has, ch it has changed Romania tremendously. And especially, you know, like for example, there, there's a decent likelihood that right now I have better internet than you have over there because for like five bucks a month, we get 500 megabytes of transfer or one gigabyte of transfer is very common here. Like we have, I think we're worldwide in the top 10 in terms of internet speed. I think we're still in the top 10. So it, it has been amazing. Also throughout, over the years, um, governments have realized that, you know, this is the major opportunity for a country like Romania that doesn't have an amazing infrastructure. This internet thing is an amazing opportunity because a lot of people like myself can get started with I didn't even have a laptop when I got started. You, I had nothing. Like I'm the textbook example of someone who started. A lot of people say, "Yeah, I started from scratch." But then they say, "Oh yeah, my parents helped me with ten thousand dollars." No, 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 no. Starting from scratch means having zero dollars in your bank account. And I was, you know, and I was able to do that. You know, the internet enables you to do that, and and, and people are 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 realizing this. And more they're, and more. they're taking advantage of the thing. To me, is if I started from zero, but I could afford this little device. Okay, this to me is the remote control communication device to the universe. I can see people talk to them. I can text them. I can email them. I can do all these wonderful things from this little, lovely little device. If I have Wi-Fi on top of it, it's even better. It's amazing to me how many young people are starting wonderful businesses with just a computer or a phone and, and selling all over the world. Here's a guy in, uh, on top of a mountain in Colorado in the USA talking to a gentleman for the first time, an economist in Romania. Which <laughs> the world is so small now. The world is so small thanks to this internet. I see it, and it's also, there's a dark side to it too. We see countries trying to control elections and shut off electricity and, and, and affect bank accounts and steal things and all that. It's, but it, isn't it better? Isn't the world better today because of this closeness with all this great communication? Yeah, it, it, it's just multiple orders of magnitude more. And I, I keep telling people, of course, there are negatives as well. You know, like think about the internet. Many of the people who were my initial clients, you know, people who had a decent amount of money back then are people who started out doing internet stuff in the 90s. And of course, a lot of internet businesses in the 90s, for example, were adult businesses. That was just the way it was, but it doesn't change the fact that we're here today, you know, and it, the internet is this, you know, truly awesome thing that enables us to do whatever we want with it, you know. It's, so, it's wonderful. For me, as an entrepreneur, in the old days, you'd have to have a lot of money to open up a re... My father came to this country. I'm the son of immigrants. My father came to this country. He escaped Nazi Germany, came to this country. He had no money, he had the shirt on his back. He saved, did jobs, he saved up money, started a little grocery store in New York City. And here I am today, uh, thanks to that man and my mother working so hard. And that to me says everything about what's great about freedom and capitalism and entrepreneurism. It, uh, that anybody, even a first generation immigrant can make it in a country where there's that much freedom. Uh, as an economist, uh, that you've studied economies and everything else. I'll give you the last word here and talk about your book a little bit more. But do you, where do you see Romania 10, 20 years from now? It's on us. It's on us. It's on us. And I hope, I hope we're going to see Romania embark on a path towards changing the Romanian dream, which is working for the government with the American dream, which is doing something for yourself, no matter what it is. And even if you don't, you try, trying stuff, not being afraid of failure. I hope to see us. On the one hand, 
it's what I hope. On the other hand, there are going to be hurdles. Europe itself is going to have to deal with hurdles because the European Union is at this point overly bureaucratic. This is making it not as competitive as it should be. And, and, and in a way, you're kind of like choking the private sector by this excessive regulation. But I do feel that if the European Union in general, in Romania in particular, if they get their act together, then in the very long term, things are going to be great over there, regardless of you know, what happens in, in, in the meantime. There are going to be bumps along the road for sure. Exactly. Governments ruin everything. They get in the way. We need governments to, for police departments, fire departments, to keep the roads clean, build bridges and things like that. I'm not denying that there's a need for some government. But I also think that the less government you, governments ruin everything. They screw up everything. Let free enterprise work its way. If you make a better product, people will buy it. If you price it too high, they're going to look for a competitor. It, there's, there's so much, it's so democratic. Capitalism is so dem democratic and that's what I love about it. You know, you're a, you're, you're a wealth of information, sir. Thank you so much. I've really <laughs> enjoyed this. I'll, uh, I'll let you have the last, tell everybody where your book, about your book, where they can find it if you want to, or, or how yeah. do they get in touch with you? Thanks, thanks a ton for having me on. They can find me by just uh, searching One Minute Economics on YouTube. I'm all over the place. And as far as my book is concerned, uh, I, I, I hope you kind of understood why I think it's important not just to read it, but to put the things I'm, I, I'm saying to good use. And my value proposition to you guys is this. If you buy my book, great. If you subscribe to my channel, perfect. But at least please don't close this browser window without giving some meaningful thought to the things we've discussed today, without doing your own research. Because it is extremely important to me to get this particular message across. Also, I'm having a big promo push this week. So one, if you buy it until Sunday, like this is a huge book, it's 400 plus pages. But if you buy it until Sunday, the digital version, of course, the print version is more expensive, but the digital version is gonna be available for just 99 cents. Just one. reading The Tulip War is worth the book. I love, yeah, I, I, mean, I am fascinated by the Netherlands and the Tulip War. And oh yeah, people have loved that it. Some other time. I, it, to me, that was mass hysteria. Uh, hy uh, hysteria, uh, 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 and it says everything about what we should avoid in the economics. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I really, especially from the history stuff, I, I've gotten really good feedback about it. I think, and, and I promise you, this book is not going to seem like this arrogant economist guy who speaks to you from his ivory tower. It's more going to be like a friend talking to you who just so happens to be good at economics. I enjoyed and, it. And two, if you if you buy this week, also hop over to uh, youtube.com forward slash one minute economics because I'm having a contest to kind of celebrate this big promo push that I'm doing. And I have some really awesome prizes. Like, uh, I know you don't like Bitcoin, but the number one prize is one Bitcoin, which is a lot of money. So even if, if people win it and don't like it, they can sell it. I also have Amazon gift cards and just a bunch of prizes that people can put to good use. So again, if you're interested in what I have to say, one, you... I'd recommend buying the book this week since it's on a discount. And two, check out my channel and maybe you're going to win some prizes as well. Andre, luck, you're, a wealth, you're a wealth of information. Your book is, uh, I, I didn't wake up this morning and say, gee, I want, to, I want to read an economic book from a guy in Romania. But I, I did read <laughs> your book and I, I, I found it. It's very well written, very well researched. And it's Thank you. Thank you for that. All these different uh, cataclysmic economic downturns and things like that and scams and things like so it's a it's a very good book so thank you and um, gee, um I hope uh, I hope to visit you in Romania someday hey would be would be awesome to have you and one of these days I'm gonna go on a tour in the United States and hit the conference front a bit and find of course it's something I always say I'm gonna do and I never find the time to do it but yeah one of these days I'm gonna be knocking on your door so <laughs> Traveling is good. It's good to travel. Yeah, yeah. Just don't, when you see, when you see a Romanian knocking on your door, don't worry. It's it, me. It's, it's <laughs> okay. Just, just bring me some good Romanian beer, okay? Will do, my we'll, friend. We'll, we'll do, do a beer with Claude Friday with Romanian beer. What's your favorite? Do you like beer? What's a, what's a beer I should buy from? And what's a good Romanian beer? Last word. Um, actually, uh, don't say Budweiser. No, no, no. These things are coming <laughs> over here as well. But, but Romanian beers are not not that amazing anymore. So even if you if, if you want a high-end beer over here, you're, you're gonna buy a 
Sorry? Wine. Uh, Romania makes wonderful wine. Oh, yeah. We make decent wine. Even the governor of our central bank has a very good win, win, uh, you know, uh, wine business. So maybe I'm going to, when I'm heading over there, I'm going to bring you a bottle of his wine and make it an economic-themed wine tasting. <laughs> well, thank you. You're a gentleman. You're a wealth of information. And you're definitely a gut salesman. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the highest compliment I can make you. Thank you so much, Andre. Thank you, Claude, and thank you guys for watching. Take care. Take care, everybody. Bye-bye.